York City and around the world, live streaming across the U.S., Canada, Latin America, and elsewhere uh, to the International U.S.-Cuba Normalization Conference. Uh, my name is Ike Nahum. I've been working with a wonderful team of people from all over the world to pull this off, uh, to organize this, to express our united call to end the blockade, which is what we're going to hear and push for all weekend. Now, we were set to do this in this very spot three years ago in March, 9, uh, March 2020, uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic uh, struck. And nevertheless, our movement advanced uh, through all those horrors and challenges politically and organization, our movement against the blockade and for solidarity with Cuba uh, advanced on those fronts, build our unity, uh, and some of those advances will be registered, or all of those advances will be registered here at this conference today, as well as the limitations and the challenges we face as we build a movement. We are building a movement, a united front that unites organizations, and activists that may not and do not uh, agree necessarily on other issues, contentious world or other issues, but are all united around our love for Cuba, our defense of Cuba, and our opposition to this disgusting blockade. So that's what unites us and that's what's gonna be registered. I'd like to take this uh, moment to re remember three comrades who have uh, brothers and sisters that have recently passed, uh, and uh, I, I want to have a moment of silence for them. First, our brother in New York, and many people know him, Frank Belgada, a leader of the, <laughs> yes, not only of the struggle for Puerto Rican liberation, uh, which uh, he was strongly identified with and a leader of, but also a central leader for decades in the fight uh, against the blockade and for Cuba solidarity. Also, Sister Jane Franklin, who recently passed in California, uh, one of our great uh, scholars, intellectuals, author of the seminal Cuba and the United States chronology. So, Sister Jane, uh, and, and lastly, our brother in Cuba, comrade uh, Javier, Bagania, uh, who was a, Los a Latin American project director for Global Health Partners. Many of us knew and loved uh, Javier, who was a friend to us all and helped us in so many ways in establishing uh, uh, the, the links uh, for humanitarian aid to Cuba. So please, let's say presente, let's have a moment of silence for those three brothers and sisters. Thank you. Frank Belgada, presente. Jane Franklin, presente. Javier Bahana, presente. Thank you. Okay, the last thing I want to say tonight, we're having a great rally at the Malcolm X and uh, uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz Center. Please come to that. I want to say in the spirit of Malcolm X that we are not going to let the U.S. government, and that's going to be a theme this entire weekend, use the false banner of democracy and human rights to slander Cuba. Uh, we're not going to let that happen. When we think of democracy in the, word, in the mouths of those people, we think of what Brother Malcolm X said. American democracy, when they use that word with a big D, is nothing but disguised hypocr hypocrisy. And we are going to tell the truth uh, this entire weekend about that. Yes. A few thank yous before I turn this over uh, to our co-chairs. Uh, one is I want to thank the entire New York, New Jersey, Cuba C team, uh, uh, headed up by Aaron and others, but also Justine, Taris. Yamir, Jason, Willie, Martin, Bill, Bob, Shep, and many others that I'm leaving out. And I also especially sent, uh, point out uh, Cesar Sanchez. I don't know if he's here, uh, but Cesar does all our beautiful graphic work, works, works uh, literally uh, in, in addition to a full-time job. So I want to thank all of those uh, folks, and especially, and we're going to hear a welcome in a second from our Fordham students that were indispensable in helping us pull this off. So I want to, before I leave, I want to do a special thank you to our sister, 
Sandy Levinson. Sandra Levinson from the Cuba Center for Cuban Studies and the Cuban Art Space. Long time, decades uh, fighter. Uh, her office, she was telling me, uh, when they had a previous incarnation was firebombed by the Gusanos, who I think have, and the, the, the rightists, our opponents. I shouldn't use the word Gusanos. Uh, Carlos told me, he says, uh, you know, it, they're haters. We're, the, there's a handful of them outside. And, uh, but in the day, they were a much more uh, terrorist presence. Uh, and anyway, Sandy experienced that. So anyway, I'm gonna give the mic. Is there a portable mic uh, to give to Sandy to say a couple of special words? We wanna thank her for this beautiful art display Go to the Center for Cuban Studies uh, and uh, donate, help them out, uh, and all of that. But Sandy, please say a couple of words. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, for the first time ever, I actually made some notes because Ike said, three minutes, Sandy. I said, okay. Educate, organize, and mobilize. That's the rallying cry of this conference, right? So this is what we have to do. This is our job. I remember a wonderful little story that someone from the Antonio Maceo after their first or second trip. They said that they were touring uh, housing cooperative. We're live streaming here, so I just need to make sure it hasn't uh, gone down there. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> they won't lose much. Um, and Fidel came. And many of these young Cuban Americans decided already, after one or two trips to Cuba, that they wanted to return to Cuba. And they said to Fidel, what do we have to do in order to come home? And Fidel said, look, you're not home here. You're really Americans. You grew up in the United States. And even though you think you want to come back here, we need you more there. We need you to fight. We need you to educate. We need you to organize. We need you to mobilize. And that's a lesson that many of us have learned. I too at one point said, to my friend Graciela, I want to live here. And she said, no, you don't. <laughs> and what's more, we need you more in the United States. So we started the Center for Cuban Studies in 1972. That's almost 51 years ago, so you know how long we've been around. And the reason we started was that our comrades in Cuba said, you're in the street but you're not in the offices. We need a place where professionals, middle of the roaders, people who aren't already on the side of Cuba will come. So we started as a library with books and then we added film because Cuban film couldn't be distributed in this United States. So they gave us the film. And then a Cuban artist said, how can you have a library without art? I'm going to make sure that you get some art. We didn't know it was illegal then. So we got art. We started bringing groups from Cuba, musical groups. We brought Silvio and Pablo the very first time they came to this country in 1972. Or maybe it was 1974. Um, and in 1992, we sued the US Treasury Department for the right to bring in legally original Cuban art, and we won. So all of the art... <laughs> yes, it, it was a real victory. But what I want to emphasize today is how important the cultural component of a revolution is. Culture enhances our quality of life it brings communities together. And for artists, their art is their daily diary. They tell us everything we really have to know about a society if we look at it. So I'm hoping that all of you, as part of educating and organizing and mobilizing, don't forget how important has been to Cuba 
their art, their music, their theater, their dance, all of their beautiful, beautiful, beautiful expressions of their culture. I'm going to end with a wonderful quote from Albert Camus. Camus. Authentic creation is a gift to the future. Let's make this conference our gift to the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. De nada. De nada, que bien. How are y'all doing? You look so good. And it's so good to be here. Well, my name is Claudia de la Cruz. I have an, an announcement that I'm going to make both in English and Spanish. I'm going to say it in Spanish first. Para quienes necesiten los auriculares para la traducción, están ahí en la esquina. Those of you who are not bilingual and will need translation, please make it to the corner and grab your translation equipment when you get a chance. Just for Spanish. Just for Spanish. Ah, bueno. Gracias, Martín. Um, my name is Claudia de la Cruz from the People's Forum. Very, very excited. Very excited to be here. Um, I told someone when I was coming down the elevator that this feels like a family reunion of folks that are doing solidarity work and have been doing solidarity work for a long time. Not only with Cuba, but with Venezuela and with Palestine and other fronts of struggle that are so important in our anti-imperialist work. And so I want to have you give yourselves a round of applause. I was told I have two minutes to make a remark. <laughs> and I'm just going to announce to folks, we don't mean to be mean today, but we really do are, have a tight ship, uh, according to Ike, that we need to make sure things work as well as needed. So um, we are going to be letting folks know when their, their time is up. And so. Now that I have taken about a minute of my two minutes to say that, I want to kind of emphasize a lot of what Sandra was saying in terms of culture and in terms of the need to be able to um, uplift a culture of life. That's what Cuba has done. When we uh, come from the United States and we go to Cuba and then have to come back, there's a cultural shock that happens. This country devalues human life. It places profit. And we know that. When they talk about democracy, we know they're talking about a democracy that serves the ruling class and not the working people who are the masses. Cuba does the opposite. And in that, in that way, it is very important for the United States to be able to blockade something like the socialist project of Cuba. Um, because it gives us hope. It actually reaffirms the fact that we can create a new world that is divorced from capitalist and imperialist values. And that's what Cuba does. The United States exports death all over the world, a country that actually emphasizes $900 billion into their military as like the center of everything they do tells you exactly where they stand. Whereas Cuba exports doctors to the rest of the world. Cuba exports culture to the rest of the world. Cuba speaks about collaboration and integration in a world that is on fire and in chaos. And so we have a lot to learn from Cuba. And those of us who are here for the first time, because I do see people who are here for the first time, if you do engage, and I hope you do engage, in the battle of ideas and emotions, make sure that you say, when you talk about Cuba, you talk about life. That's what we're talking about. And this is a battle, again, of emotions and ideas that we need to win. Because if we don't win the battle of emotions and ideas and move millions of people in support of life, humanity is done. That is where we are today. Right. And so this is very urgent. This is very real. And I hope that when you come out of this space, just as those folks that have been doing solidarity work, folks that have been my teachers in doing this, you too become a teacher to others. And so welcome so much to this space. I hope it's a space of learning. I hope it's a space of re-energizing. And I hope it's a space where we live this space with the commitment of actually building and re-energizing the anti-imperialist movement that needs to be rebuilt in this country. Thank you so much. I will, I have the deep pleasure of co-chairing today with a, a sister in, in arms and struggles from Canada. And so I'm gonna let her introduce herself and I'm gonna step back for a minute. <laughs> 
All right, let's give a big thank you to Claudia. Good morning, New York, and folks uh, streaming in from around the world. My name is Tamara Hansen. I'm the coordinator of Vancouver Communities in Solidarity with Cuba. I'm also uh, on the editorial board of the Fire This Time newspaper. Uh, and I am an organizer with the US-Cuba Normalization Conference Committee. We've been working together now uh, for many years throughout the pandemic uh, in trying to uh, not only organize conferences, but also webinars, uh, street actions, and building uh, a way that folks in Canada, the United States, Puerto Rico, Mexico, and other places around the world can come together to build a united front against the cruel and unjust US blockade on Cuba. We know uh, that Cuba is in a challenging situation today after the COVID-19 pandemic, um, after the, the um, issues around tourism having to stop because of the pandemic. And yet, uh, we've seen what Cuba is capable of at the same time, sending doctors around the world, prioritizing education, prioritizing uh, the creation of new vaccine technologies. All of these things are what continue to inspire us. And some of you might be here today at your very first Cuba Solidarity Conference. Some of you might be here at your 30th or 40th Cuba Solidarity Conference. <laughs> But this conference was built for all of us. This is a united umbrella where we are welcoming everybody who wants to take a stand against this cruel US policy that has been in place for over 60 years. It was too much when it was one year. It was too much when it was 10 years. It was too much when it was 20 years. And now here we are, 60 years of blockade. Anyone in Cuba under the age of 60 has lived their whole life under this cruel US policy. And we have an obligation, not only as people in the United States, but as an international community to come together to condemn this blockade and to make sure it ends now. Cuba si bloqueo no. Cuba si bloqueo no. Cuba si bloqueo no. Woo. Of course, an even more immediate demand for us today is to demand that US President Joe Biden remove Cuba from this so-called state sponsors of terrorists list. We know this is hypocrisy. This is cruelty towards Cuba. Being on this list is preventing Cuba not only from doing exchanges with the United States, but with governments around the world. We have an obligation to cry to all the people who are willing to listen, how Cuba has stood up against terrorism time and time again, how Cuba again has sent doctors around the world, not bombs and war and colonialism or imperialism. It is the height of hypocrisy that Joe Biden sits in the White House and leaves Cuba on the list of so-called state sponsors of terrorism. And we need to build a campaign in unity with all organizations who are willing to demand that Joe Biden remove Cuba from this list. We are very excited to be here together this weekend as we work together to come up with a plan to build a stronger, more united Cuba solidarity movement, whether it's traveling to Cuba, whether it's how women in Cuba are taking a lead against the criminal blockade, whether it's talking about the history of Cuba and Africa. We have so many exciting topics that we're gonna be covering and we're really looking forward to leaving this weekend with a plan of action with a plan for how we can continue after this weekend to build a united campaign to bring an end to the blockade on Cuba. So I'm so excited for this weekend and all that we're going to accomplish. Lift the blockade on Cuba! Lift the blockade on Cuba! Cuba si bloqueo no! Cuba si bloqueo no! Thank you so much everybody. I'm gonna hand it back to Claudia to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Tamara. Again, if you are not part of an organization, there's a whole bunch of organizations upstairs that are, have materials, talk to people, 
um, this struggle is urgent. And thank you so much, Tamara, for raising the demands. We want to work towards lifting the blockade against Cuba. We will get Cuba off the states that sponsor terrorism list. We will get them off. And we will lift the blockade. Yes. And we will establish relationships that are based on collaboration as it's meant to be. And so I have the extreme honor of welcoming a friend um, and a liberation theologian, my comrade and friend, Revelenda Dolimar Malave Lebron, who's pastor of the People's Church, a historic church in El Barrio, and who's also an associate director of IFCO Passes for Peace. She's going to be doing the invocation with us today. Thank you to uh, my sister and comrade, I call her Bishop, Claudia, de la Cruz. Uh, my name is Dolomar Lebron. It is so good to be here with you on behalf of IFCO Pastors for Peace and uh, FSUMC, the People's Church in, in Harlem. We wanna just, again, greet all our, our uh, visitors and guests and all our comrades that are here with us today. Um, I greet you with all the love and solidarity and revolutionary fervor of the many giants who have already shown us the way, the giants that are present here among us, and the generations of those that will come after us. What a gift to hold space for such important conversations that not only impact the Cuban people, but impact the world. Whether we are here in Manhattan or in California, uh, the fight to protect and uphold these principles and values of the Cuban revolution are integral to those of us who believe in a new world, integral to those of us who consider ourselves dreamers and believers that another world is possible right here on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, as we have already heard, we are living in a moment in a particular time in history where the most vulnerable of the world have become even more vulnerable where oceans and temperatures continue to rise, where gun violence in the US still rising, drug abuse is still rising, unemployment and hopelessness is still rising, where everywhere in the, in the United States right now, US rent is rising and communities are being displaced, where the powers that be continue to prove over and over again that our health is debatable, that our humanity is debatable. In a moment when the US and its imperialist forces are attempting to have a stronghold and maintain their dominance in the world uh, in every way, politically, economically, militarily, what the US blockade on Cuba has meant is just death and misery and pain. And the government of the people of the United States has strangled not only the economy of the Cuban people, but their hopes and their dreams and their possibility. And so it's important for those of us dreamers, those of us believers who, who understand this very important responsibility of protecting and defending life and dignity and justice and truth, this work is ours to do. You know, an invocation in, in, in very general terms is the action of invoking something or someone's for assistance or as some form of authority. And so yes, this work of justice, this work of believing and fighting to transform our society is the work of the heart. And yes, we invoke the spirit into this place in whatever way that makes sense to you. I invoke the spirit that is upon me to bring good news to the poor, to heal brokenhearted, to bring freedom and justice to the cactus, captive and to lift the veil of deceit so that those who have, cannot see can see. But I also invite you, I invite all of us in this space to invoke the spirits of all of our freedom fighters, all of our leaders, of our grandmothers, of our madrinas and our tias and our tios and our grandfathers who are here present with us today. I lift up the name of Reverend Lucius Walker. Presente. We lift up the name of Alicia Harapco. Presente. Any other names that we want to lift up? 
Frank Felgata. Presente. Presente. Malcolm X. Presente. Fidel Castro Rus. Presente. 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 And we continue to lift up these names both out loud and in our hearts because those of us who understand the solidarity really is the strongest bond amongst the people and is imperative for the salvation of the world that we, as we've already heard, to fight against the blockade, to fight against sanctions and against this administration and hold any government accountable for death that they wage on this world. I know that we're already walking in victory and that we will succeed. It doesn't matter how long it takes, it doesn't matter when, today in defense of a country like Cuba, tomorrow we will defend another country. As Comandante en Jefe Fidel Castro would say, men and women pass, governments pass, empires pass, but ideas live on. Noble, just ideas are eternal. And yes, we are here waging war in this battle of ideas. And my prayer will always be Cuba si bloqueo no. May this be our prayer as we open up this space. May this be our prayer throughout this weekend. May this be our prayer when we leave this place. And may we make it front and center in all that we do. Cuba si bloqueo no. We will see this blockade end in our, with our eyes. It will happen. We are already in victory, ever onward towards victory, friends. Viva Cuba! Viva, Viva La Paz! Viva. Viva la solidaridad entre los pueblos! Viva. Cuba sí! Cuba sí! Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Uh, we are continuing with our program this morning. We've got some amazing speakers. Um, we are going to now invite up uh, two university students from Fordham University, Shivani and Ibrahim, uh, to give a welcoming to the university. Please give them a warm welcome. All right, I don't know if we can match the energy of the previous speakers uh, or the expertise. Uh, and ours is, oh, sorry. Um, I don't think we can match the energy or the expertise of the previous think, uh, speakers. Um, so we just wanna say thank you to everyone who's come to the campus today. Uh, Ike Aaron and the whole conference committee have worked so hard on this and it's been a pleasure to be, in, to be involved and to watch them uh, work through it all and to be able to be here with such interesting people. Um, we're just going to give a, a short little hello, um, and we're going to, you know, not go on for too long. Uh, so I'll pass it over to Shivani. Yeah. So. Sure. Oh, thank you. Yes, so no doubt today's panels and dialogues are as important as they are unique, and rarely do such candid and open intergenerational conversations get to occur between activists and scholars in Cuba, the U.S., and those who are watching from abroad. And even more rarely does this happen at a U.S. law school, because we know what kind of law they teach. This event will touch on a range of topics from the artistic to the political, 
Not that there is necessarily a distinction between the two. Abrahim and I are the co-chairs of Fordham's National, Lawyer Guild, National Lawyers Guild chapter, the nation's oldest and largest progressive bar association, and it was the first one in the United States to be racially integrated. Our mission is to use the law for the people, uniting lawyers, law students, legal workers, and jailhouse lawyers to function as an effective force in the service of the people by valuing human rights and the rights of ecosystems over property interests. Yeah, we at the NLG are, are really proud to be part of, of this event. Um, you know, we, we've only recently learned that this is not the first time that Fordham NLG has been involved with this back in 2017. Our predecessors did this. Because of the pandemic, there was a, you know, a bit of a gap and we lost contact. So it's great to create the contact again between uh, us and this, these organizers. Um, we at Fordham NLG often feel like we're an island of progressivism in, in, in the world of law. Um, but it's good to know that we're not completely alone out there, uh, even if it feels that way often. Uh, yeah, so I just want to say many made this event possible. Um, you know, again, I want to thank the, every, all the panelists and the organizers, but I also want to thank Fordham's P uh, Public Interest Resource Center um, for putting us in touch and for getting this started. Uh, and I want to give a big thanks uh, to my co-chair who really took the lead on this project and, you know, helped make this possible, uh, organized getting the rooms. Yeah. So I just really wanted to give her a big thanks. Um, so just to close us out, um, it is such an honor to be a part of this work that you all have been doing for decades. We are both the children of immigrants from countries which are certainly complicated, but also have their own distinctive revolutionary traditions. I want to especially name three of my diaspora inspirations in Heroes. The first is Kartar Singh Saraba, an Indian revolutionary who was a part of the Ghadar Party, which advocated for Indian independence in Berkeley, California. In November 1915, he was executed by the British at Central Jair Lahore for his role in the movement when he was 19 years old. Jayabin Desai, the leader of the Grunwick dispute in the UK, also known as the Strikers and Saris, in 1976, in spite of the lack of support from the Trades Union Congress, which did not want to support Asian women. And lastly, Fatima Mir, who was an anti-apartheid activist in South Africa, and amongst her many accomplishments, uh, wrote Nelson Mandela's autobiography. They remind us that power is not up there and out of reach, but rather it is amongst us, the people. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna ask for another big round of applause for Ibrahim and Shabani. Um, we couldn't have held we couldn't have held this conference in the space without them. So thank you. I felt kind of off. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for putting me on. <laughs> All right, so we do want to welcome to the space two comrades and um, friends of the U.S. from Cuba that just walked in. Yuri Gala, who's the deputy permanent representative to Cuba's UN mission. And we do want to uh, ask our, our comrade and friend, Ambassador Pedro Luis Pedro Socuesta, to come in and say hi for a few seconds because he, he is on his way to the airport and he actually stopped by to say hi. And so we want to make sure that Ambassador Cuesta gets the time to say hi. Gracias. Well, uh, hello, hi to everybody. I, I, I was not, I, I was not intended to uh, spoil uh, your very, very nice crafted program. Uh, I was not in the, you know, in, in, in the list, so uh, you're a little bit provocative in, in in bringing me up here. And I know that Ambassador Judy has a, um, an, a statement and also a colleague from um, the Women's Federation and ICAB. They also have, a, a, you know, the, like the master presentation. So I'm not gonna rob that uh, from them. But it's a pleasure indeed to say hello to all of you and to see you in these big numbers here in this event. Uh, we, we had this session last year at the People's Forum, and it was a very successful 
uh, event. We were delighted because we saw a lot of people there. But this year, we are seeing that you have double or triple those numbers. <laughs> so <clears throat> that is the first thing that I would like to recognize, how you people, you have organized it, this, and you, uh, you have come all together. So many organizations and, and, and coalitions in, in, in making this possible. And this proved the strength of unity because you have got um, united in preparing this, in organizing this. I'm seeing a lot of faces and I'm recognizing now the, the many faces at the, at the table. I mean, people who have been there for many years, but also new people. Th that is also very encouraging uh, because, I mean, is the new generations coming up, and that is also very important. So thank you first very much to the organizers for putting this together and bringing so uh, many people. Thank you very much to all of you uh, who putting aside your many responsibilities and, and, and duty. You have come together to this um, Saturday's event uh, at this magnificent university and to share with us some uh, sessions of uh, changes and, and, and talks on, on, on the need to, to leave the embargo, to leave the blockade, um, and what we need to do together to, to make that possible. We have seen um, some movement that is very much a movement originated from the root, originated from you. If there is something happening outside whatever it is, is because you are doing that possible and because you are bringing together uh, the voices that are uh, that feel that this is just unfair not only is immoral not only is illegal but it's also unfair to Cuba uh, so thank you very much for that I'm pretty sure this is going to be uh, another success and I'm pretty sure that this would be again the basis for further action in order to lift up the blockade, which is the main purpose behind this agenda. I also want to welcome our uh, very powerful delegation uh, to the session of the uh, UN Commission on Women. It's all a women, it's all a women delegation. So we, we, we have to talk about uh, discrimination the other way around discrimination against men but we are very happy to see to see our women in in such a powerful uh, manner representing um, Cuban women at the commission and the, this was just a joke uh, they know how how much we appreciate them so thank you very much And last but not least, thank you very much to all of you for making this possible and for being here today. Thank you. Viva! 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 All right, familia. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for those words. And Cuban women are the pillar of the revolution, so I I'm with you. Welcome to our sisters. I would like to um, introduce, I have the, the utmost pleasure and honor to introduce one of, one of my teachers, and I'm sure one of the teachers of many who are here, Dr. Rosemary. She is a long, long, long time activist. She's a scholar. If you haven't read the book on the meeting of Malcolm X and Fidel, I suggest you get it and read it. Um, she's one of the keepers of our traditions, our radical socialist traditions. And I'm so very honored to welcome her, welcome her into this space. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 
I welcome you from the indigenous people's land, the Lenape people, whose pillars we also stand on as a part of the incredible, incredible genocide that was committed. This morning, I'm really honored to be here. To all the young people, and especially those of you who are new, and to the Cuban delegation and all of my sisters from Cuba, we welcome you. I just want to say one thing to all of the newcomers. This struggle is not for the vain. This struggle is not for the tourists. This is a long haul, a long haul. And you have to be committed. You have to be committed. It's not a struggle to sit on the sidelines and watch what we're doing. We engage you. Those of you who are watching us internationally, we engage you to become a part of this struggle so that it can be real. It's a struggle in the defense of all of humanity. It is a struggle in defense of all of humanity. It's a long haul. I stand before you because of my love for Cuba, my love for Africa, and our love for the people. Cuba taught me much of that love. And it's over 40 some years and I can stand with Sandra and all of the rest of you old timers who are out there. I am also honored that some years ago I was given a medal, which I'm proudly wearing today. It's equivalent to what we say the Peace Prize. It's a friendship medal and I bear it and I take it as a responsibility in all of my work to carry forth that Cuba that we love and that we know and that we have to defend and struggle for. We have a lot of work to do. Here in New York for the past, since 2015, we have attempted to get a resolution before the New York City Council, just symbolic demanding an end to the blockade, asking the president to intervene, that Congress should do so. And it's been a hard struggle, but there's some people here today who have been in the forefront of that struggle. It's, and now we move this session of the New York City Council to resolution 0285. And I'm going to briefly introduce two important people who are in the forefront of carrying forth that resolution because as I was talking to Yuri last night, our brother, if New York passes this resolution, it's making a statement right. to the world. Right. Even though 30, 40, 30, 40, 50 other cities around the country, 30 other 40, 50 other cities around the country, but people are looking at New York yeah, yeah. because it is the center of capitalism. It is the center of invoking imperialism. And that's why this symbolic resolution is so important. At this time, I'd like to introduce my brother in struggle and comrade and in other issues that I won't mention. Um, <laughs> brother Omawali Clay. <laughs> who is representing who is representing from the New York City Council, our brother who could not be here, Brother Charles Barron, a fighter who, who introduced Resolution 0285. And Om Omawali will um, share with you and bring your message from the council member. And after that, another sister friend who was the, one of the first to sign on as a sponsor of the resolution our sister council member, Gail Brewer. So at this time, we want to welcome you. We want to thank you for coming. And I look forward to seeing you. And also upstairs, we will have copies of Fidel and Malcolm X. And if you want to purchase, you can. Thank you. And there'll be autograph, OK?
Uh, peace, comrades. First, on behalf of uh, Councilmember Charles Barron, I bring you greetings. But as Charles and us all know, I also bring you greetings from Sister Viola Plummer, Chair of the December 12th Movement. Uh, our sister Rosemary is talking about history. And one of the histories I first want to say about the resolution, which is a simple resolution to do the right thing. I had to confront one of the council people last night, and now we're up to 24 council members. To have signed. <laughs> but in just in saying a few words, let me just pay respects to somebody who is always dear to us in the December 12th movement, who taught us so much about the international situation, our brother and comrade Miguel Alfonso, who is no longer with us. Many of you may not know Miguel, but Miguel was in the human rights struggle inside Geneva and around the world. But he taught us patiently that there are different battlefields. And in each battlefield, there's a particularity to the confrontation, to the strategy and tactics of that battlefield. He taught us how to operate inside the United Nations. And the culmination of that was the World Conference Against Racism in South Africa a number of years ago. But he also was instructive in terms of our struggle inside the New York City Council, whose appearance would make it seem that it's gotten more progressive. But in reality, it is still controlled by a machine that has the politics of capitalism and imperialism, intimidation, and if you disagree, you get punished for that. So it's been a battle, but we're committed, and the councilman wanted me to say to you, we're committed as long as we have also council members like council member Brewer, Gail Brewer, <laughs> that we will win that battle. I've always had the privilege inside the December 12th movement to do a lot of the propaganda and slogans. We created no justice, no peace. We created whose streets, our streets. Uh, we created the slogans, what's coming, war. But one of the most powerful ones we created that I certainly thank our comrade Rosemary for, because I had an opportunity to go to Cuba in 1990 for a very historic conference, Malcolm X into the 90s. And at that conference, I had an opportunity to listen to Fidel Castro lay out one of the most historic battles for Africa, which was the Battle of Quita Carnival. That battle, many folks, as time goes on, will learn how important it was and critical it was for African people that that battle be won. And Cuba laid its life on the line, not just in blood, but in even to the point of where undermining the possibility of the revolution in Cuba to build the solidarity it wanted to build with Africa. We African people have never forgotten that and will never forget that. And so one of the slogans that was created there was, Africa called and Cuba answered. And so we come, and so let me just say, we come to see about Cuba because Cuba came to see about us. So good afternoon, I'm Gail Brewer, uh, city council member for the Upper West Side. You're, thank you very much. Um, I'm here for uh, many reasons, one of which I think Sandy remembers. My friend was Terry Santana, a long time ago, and um, she was Cuban. She came here in 61, she was a reporter for different newspapers, and she took on her family and her friends and was very supportive of Cuba and at that point, Fidel Castro. So that's how I first got introduced to this amazing country. And then um, in uh, 2017, I think with some of you, we went uh, to the Jose Marte statue opening because it had been a replica paid for by the Bronx Museum of Art and uh, contributors. It was an amazing time to be in Cuba. 
Um, the folks from the Bronx Museum and their contributors had raised money for this and brought it to Havana. Obviously, there's one here in New York. And that particular time, we went with John Albert, who's with the downtown a group that works on uh, documentaries. John has spent a great deal of time uh, filming in Cuba and has amazing documentaries of the country and its people. Um, and then uh, at that point, obviously, uh, with Mariela Castro, talking to her about all the work she's done for LGBTQ, but also just in terms of her country and what she believes in. So this is a, a very personal for me, like for many of you. I do remember in 2017, though, for those who don't understand the importance of having relations, that when Obama, some of you were probably there, and there was a bit of a detente, Restaurants were full, uh, tourists were there. Uh, the, the, our country is making a huge mistake by not, not only for the Cuban people, but for the American people, for God's sake. You know, you can go there and enjoy the beauty of it. It's good for Cuba and it's good for America. I don't understand why people don't understand that. That is exactly what we should be doing. It's the number one reason to stop the blockade. And I want to say I'm obviously on the resolution. Uh, I hope it passes. I know that there's a lot of effort going into it. But the, the, the absurdity of not having a relationship makes no sense whatsoever. But we have to keep pushing because there's so much opposition that is, in this country, there's a lot of opposition to everything. But you have to keep working and that's how you are successful. So I'm here to say uh, how supportive I am. Um, to also say that there is, um, I think, a lot of misunderstanding, and that's why we, this conference is so important, because you have to keep explaining the importance of the relationship existing. I also want to thank the Consul General's office, because over the years, many, many years, all the way back to the 1970s, I've tried to be supportive of them, and they've been supportive of me. And there's another injustice which is that they cannot travel very far. They, you, they can't even go 25 miles, which was in the past. They can only go a few miles. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. So I just want to add that to the injustices. And they uh, can't come, yeah, can't do anything. So there's something wrong with all of that. So thank you for being here. I'm on the resolution. I look forward to passage, but also look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Fantastic. Thank you so much to Gail Brewer and Omowale Clay for being here with us today. What a powerful message from uh, the city councilors of New York. Um, we are now, I'm now uh, honored to introduce uh, Gail Walker, uh, director of IFCO Pastors for Peace. I have been had the chance to travel twice uh, to Cuba with Gail, and she is a tremendous leader in the Cuba Solidarity Movement and in bringing folks from across the United States down to Cuba to learn more about the Cuban reality. And so um, really uh, great to have her here today and uh, the continued support for IFCO Pastors for Peace. So please give a warm welcome to Gail Walker. Thank you so much, uh, Tamara. I just want to say real quickly to Gail Brewer before she walks out the room. Can you hear me? <laughs> Council, Councilwoman uh, Gail Brewer. Anyway, Cuba has a serious friend in this council and, and our friend uh, Gail Brewer. Thank you for everything you're doing to help make this resolution possible. Working alongside, of course, our brother Charles Barron's. Gracias. I won't speak long. I will just want to say good afternoon, um, friends, uh, those here in the room, and of course those online. Um, a good afternoon to our dear friend uh, Ambassador Pedroso and Ambassador Gala, uh, and all of our uh, friends uh, here, our honored guests from Cuba, from the uh, Federation of Cuban Women, from the National Jurists, and of course from our friends at ECAP. We're grateful to have you here as the director not only of IFCO Pastors for Peace, but as the proud co-chair of the National Council, the National Network on Cuba. Um, I bring you heartfelt greetings. Um, it's already been spoken about, but we're gathering at a very important time a very difficult time, not only for our friends and our family in Cuba, for, but for all of us who seek a better world. There's an old saying, 
uh, in the black community here. Uh, and I think that it, it generally uh, applies not only to, to uh, folk of color, but all of us who struggle for justice. Uh, it's a saying that goes like this. When white people catch a cold, black people catch pneumonia. How many people of you have heard that? <laughs> right? It kind of, it sounds a little odd, but the reality is that it's another way uh, of saying, loosely translated, that uh, hardships for privileged, often privileged people, is deadly for those of us who are stuck at the bottom ladder of the economic rung. And that is why Cuba is such an important uh, symbol, such an important expression of support, of solidarity for people of color, people who are struggling for justice. Cuba is our North Star. So that's why we're here, right? Of course, we're here to lift up and defend our sister nation, Cuba, and its dogged right to self-determination. But perhaps more to the point, we're here because we recognize and deeply respect and admire all that Cuba has done to endure and has had to endure over the past six decades um, in, in the shape of a, a brutal blockade. And yet she and her beautiful people continue to keep rising, not just for Cuba, but for the world. So simply put, that's why we stand with Cuba. And we beam with pride when we think of our, our Cuban family. Countless examples, but we know about Cuba's uh, uh, medical internationalism. Hundreds of doctors that have traveled to dozens of countries to provide urgently needed medical care. We know about the recent passage of the Family Code, which was passed by um, a countrywide referendum in which there was really a, a, a focus on the needs of how to define family, which has been an incredible example that we and the rest of the world continue to look to. We'll hear more about the family code, I'm sure, throughout this weekend. And then, of course, lastly, I just want to point to Cuba's um, uh, position as the head of G77 plus China. That's a really important um, uh, position that, that Cuba has taken on. This year, Cuba has looked, uh, has for the first time in history, um, really been in this position to uh, create this incredible presence at this incredibly important moment, not only for the island, but for developing countries. So I just want to say that Cuba's responsibility is tremendous. It's tremendous for Cuba, but it's tremendous for those of us who look to Cuba as an example. And it, I want to just really lastly say many of us, I'm going to use the, the example of the, uh, the Olympics. How many people, if you're watching the Olympics, root for Cuba? Come on, I know, right? So I don't care if it's baseball, if it's volleyball, if, even if it's something like wrestling. I don't know anything about wrestling, but I'm over there rooting for Cuba because I know Cuba represents me, represents us. <laughs> Lastly, I just want to end with a quote from our beloved Fidel Castro, who said, the equal right of all citizens to health, education, work, food, security, culture, science, and well-being. That is the same rights that we proclaimed when we began our struggle. In addition to those which emerge from our dreams of justice and equality for all inhabitants of the world. And that is what I wish for. That's what Fidel Castro said, and I think we can certainly say that that's what we all wish for and will continue to, uh, and why we will continue to stand in love, love, loving solidarity with Cuba. So, bye-bye uh, blockade. Abajo blockade. Unblock Cuba. Cuba is not alone. We are here with you. Very quickly, I want to, I have the distinct honor and pleasure to introduce uh, a special guest here with us from the uh, Cuban Institute for Friendship with the uh, Peoples, our dear sister, Noemi, who I'm going to ask to come forward. She wears many, many hats. But we have been honored to meet with our sister Noemi, to have an opportunity to learn from her 
and uh, we're looking forward to hearing directly from uh, Noemi and from all of our friends at ECAP. Thank you for being here and thank you for all you do. Queridos amigas, queridas amigas, queridos amigos, un saludo, un saludo caluroso a todos los presentes y a quienes nos siguen desde las plataformas digitales. Querido embajador Pedroso, querido embajador Yuri, todos, es una emoción tremenda saludarla. Necesito, eh, deseo comenzar agradeciendo a los movimientos de solidaridad con Cuba, de Estados Unidos, Canadá, Puerto Rico y de otros países que se han unido online para participar en esta conferencia internacional por la normalización de las relaciones de Estados Unidos-Cuba. Destacar especialmente nuestro reconocimiento al comité organizador que durante meses han laborado esmeradamente en la coordinación de los paneles temáticos, la articulación de las ideas y la propuesta de los eventos culturales en esta extraordinaria sede de la Universidad de Fordham. Quisiera extenderles un cálido abrazo a nombre de Fernando González Llor, presidente del Instituto Cubano de Amistad con los Pueblos y héroe de la República de Cuba. Me pidió que les agradeciera en su nombre por la participación de ustedes en este evento y por el, el enorme esfuerzo que siempre realizan para que la verdad de Cuba se escuche en su justo reclamo por su autodeterminación e independencia. Fernando me aseguraba sobre las emociones que tendríamos al llegar a Nueva York y ciertamente este evento nos hace recordar los lazos históricos que unen a esta ciudad con Cuba y con su lucha revolucionaria justo en este año del 170 aniversario del natalicio de José Martí, vale resaltar que fue precisamente desde Nueva York que se publicaron sus versos sencillos, La Edad de Oro y el periódico Patria. Aquí también se gestó y fundó el Partido Revolucionario Cubano con el fin de organizar la independencia de Cuba y apoyar la de Puerto Rico. And certainly this event reminds us of the historical ties that bind the city with Cuba in its revolutionary struggle. Precisely this year on the 170th anniversary of Jose Martin's birth. It's worth noting that it was precisely in New York that his writings titled Simple Verses and the Golden Age and the newspaper Patria were published. It was also here that the Cuban Revolutionary Party was founded with the purpose of organizing the independence of Cuba and supporting the independence of Puerto Rico. Ante la campaña neocolonial que se intenta imponer a nuestro pueblo para que olviden su historia, este espacio de diálogo es un digno homenaje al aporte imprescindible de José Martí a la independencia y soberanía de Cuba. Hoy como ayer, las agrupaciones solidarias en Estados Unidos y la emigración patriótica se unen para reclamar el cese de las campañas difamatorias y las agresiones contra nuestro país. In face of the 
is award to you the indispensable contribution of Jose Marti to the independence and sovereignty of Cuba. Today, as they did yesterday, solidarity groups in the United States and patriotic immigrants come together to demand the end of this slander campaign and assault against our country. Más de 60 años de un cruel y despiadado bloqueo económico, comercial y financiero contra Cuba han transcurrido. A los amigos que nos acompañan en esta sala y a quienes nos siguen por internet, les invito a reflexionar sobre sus daños y consecuencias. ¿Cuántos de nosotros hemos sufrido estas sanciones durante todas nuestras vidas? ¿Cuánto tiempo llevan ustedes condenando y denunciando permanentemente estas injustas sanciones. ¿Cuántos de ustedes han experimentado las consecuencias extraterritoriales del bloqueo? ¿Cuántos de ustedes han podido visitar Cuba estos últimos tres años y han percibido el incremento del daño que ha ocasionado la política de máxima presión sobre nuestro pueblo? I ask our friends who are with us in this room and those who follow us on the internet consider the damage and the consequences it has represented. How many of us have faced the effects of these sanctions through our entire lives? How long have you been constantly condemning and denouncing these unjust sanctions? How many of you have experienced the extraterritorial consequences of the blockage? How many of you have been able to visit Cuba over the past three years and have witnessed the increasing damage inflicted by the policy of maximum pressure on our people? La situación actual de Cuba es muy compleja, provocada por una genocida política de bloqueo impuesta por el gobierno de los Estados Unidos, recrudecida en extremo, que ha sometido a la economía cubana a tensiones extraordinarias que impacta en el deterioro del nivel de vida de las familias, en la inflación, los precios, los salarios, la disponibilidad de alimentos y medicinas, el servicio eléctrico, y golpea los ingresos del país, las transacciones financieras, la industria, la construcción, los servicios, el comercio, la inversión, la salud y la educación. Caused by a genocidal blockage policy imposed by the United States government and intensified to the extreme, which has subjected the Cuban economy to extraordinary tensions that lead to worsening living standards for families and inflation, that have an impact on rates, on the availability of food and medicines, on electrical service, on the country's income, on financial transactions, industry construction, services, trade, investment, health and education. Es una política que provoca privaciones en toda nuestra sociedad y resulta más hostil en los más vulnerables como los niños, las embarazadas, los ancianos y los discapacitados. Además, estimula deliberadamente la emigración, en especial de las personas calificadas y en edad laboral. It's a policy that causes hardships throughout our society and hits hardest the most vulnerable, such as children, pregnant women, the elderly, and the disabled. This policy also deliberately encourages immigration, especially by those with skills and on working age. Ustedes fácilmente pueden identificar las medidas que aún hoy están intactas. Se mantienen activados el título 3 de la ley Hell Burton, la lista de entidades restringidas, la persecución a nuestra cooperación médica y la infame e infundada inclusión de Cuba en la lista arbitraria de países que supuestamente patrocinan el terrorismo, lo que impide el acceso a financiamientos, créditos y nuevas inversiones. Además, se continúa financiando operaciones de desestabilización y campañas de descréditos contra Cuba. You can easily point to the measures that remain intact today. Title three of the Helmsworth Act, the list of restricted entities, the attacks on our medical cooperation, and the infamous and unfounded inclusion of Cuba on the arbitrary list of countries 
that allegedly sponsored terrorism, all these continue. They prevent access to financing, credit, and new investments. In addition, destabilization operations and slander campaigns against Cuba continue to be financed. El bloqueo no solo afecta al pueblo cubano, también daña a los países que pueden recibir una ayuda solidaria de Cuba. Afecta además al pueblo estadounidense, al que se le limita el derecho de viajar libremente a nuestro país, restringiendo los intercambios académicos, culturales y científicos y el acceso a tratamientos y medicamentos cubanos. It also affects the American people, whose right to travel freely to our country is restricted, limiting academic, cultural, and scientific exchanges, and access to Cuban medical treatment and medicine. El movimiento de solidaridad con Cuba ha rechazado y condenado enérgicamente esta injusta y arbitraria política. Ejemplos lo constituyen las jornadas internacionales contra el bloqueo los fines de semana de cada mes con caravanas de autos y bicicletas convocadas por el proyecto Puentes de Amor, la Cumbre de los Pueblos en Los Ángeles, la campaña Salvando Vidas, el proyecto Atuey, las resoluciones locales contra el bloqueo, la respuesta solidaria ante los daños provocados por los siniestros del Hotel Saratoga, la base de supertanquero de Matanzas y el huracán Ian, las recogidas de fondos para enviar medicamentos promovidas por los amigos y la emigración patriótica. The Cuba Solidarity Movement has strongly rejected and condemned this unjust and arbitrary policy. Examples of this are the International Days of Action Against the Blockade on weekends of every month, with car and bike caravans organized by bridges of law, the People's Summit in Los Angeles, the Saving Lives Campaign, the Houthi Project, the local resolutions against the blockade, the solidarity organized in response to the damage caused by the disasters of the Saratoga Hotel, the Super Tanker Oil Depot in Matanzas, and Hurricane Ian, as well as funding raising efforts to send medicine promoted by friends and patriotic India. En el espacio mediático, también se desempeñó un importante papel en la denuncia a los planes injerencistas y subversivos contra la revolución con diversas iniciativas como los piquetes virtuales contra el bloqueo de más de 24 horas consecutivas y los intercambios virtuales los 17 de cada mes, entre otros. Siempre hemos contado con el apoyo inestimable de diferentes sectores de la sociedad estadounidense que apuestan por una, re una relación civilizada, respetuosa y de colaboración entre nuestros pueblos. Helping denounce the interference and subversive plans against the revolution by various initiatives, such as virtual picket lines against the blockade for more than 24 consecutive hours, and the virtual exchanges on the 17th of each month, among others. We have always enjoyed the invaluable support of different sectors of the United States society that are committed to a civilized, respectful, and collaborative relationship between our peoples. Aprovecho para reconocer a varios proyectos que nos han acompañado en esta ardua batalla por la verdad. La Caravana Pastore por la Paz, las Brigadas Venceremos de Estados Unidos, la Juan Río Rivera de Puerto Rico y la Che Guevara y Calito García de Canadá, así como las Caravanas de Puentes de Amor. the Venceremos Brigade in the United States, the Juan Rios Rivera Brigade in Puerto Rico, and the Che Guevara and Calixto Garcia Brigades in Canada, the Bridges of Law Caravans. Ante la infamia que Cuba es un estado fallido, se estrella la voluntad de un pueblo de continuar adelante. Ese pueblo que produjo sus propias vacunas contra la COVID-19 y que con resistencia creativa se esfuerza por construir un socialismo cada vez más próspero y sostenible. El nivel de contagio en este año 2023 es de 11,2 por día 
y no hay ningún fallecido por COVID en Cuba, el 85% de los medicamentos utilizados en el protocolo de manejo clínico de la enfermedad fueron desarrollados y producidos por la biotecnología cubana. Jamás renunciaremos a vivir en paz y cumplir nuestros proyectos de vida familiar y profesional como máxima realización humana. En los últimos años se han emprendido nuevos procesos de actualización de nuestro modelo socialista que iniciaron con la aprobación en referéndum popular de una nueva constitución en el 2019. Es un marco jurídico institucional para la protección y promoción de los derechos humanos para todas las cubanas y cubanos. It provides an institutional legal framework for the protection and promotion of human rights for all Cubans, men and women. El nuevo Código de las Familias, con una concepción de avanzada, ofrece amplia protección a los derechos de los menores, las mujeres, los ancianos, la comunidad LTV, LGTBIQ+, las personas con necesidades especiales, entre otros. La Ley de Procesamiento Penal o de procedimiento penal, implicó una transformación y ampliación de las garantías legales. También hubo cambios novedosos con el diseño y aprobación de nuevos actores económicos para dinamizar la vida económica y productiva del país. The criminal procedure law has meant a transformation and expansion of legal guarantees. There were also novel changes with the design and approval of new economic actors to invigorate the economic and productive life of the country. En lo social, con una mirada más profunda hacia nuestras comunidades, se han iniciado y desarrollado extensos proyectos de transformación no solo en infraestructura, sino en calidad de vida y en mayor acceso a oportunidades para los habitantes de los barrios más vulnerables. On the social front, taking a deeper look at our communities, extensive transformation projects have been initiated and developed, not only in infrastructure, but in quality of life and in greater opportunities for the residents of the most vulnerable neighborhoods. Como noticia novedosa del día de hoy, Acabamos de, acaba de regresar a Cuba 32 médicos cubanos organizados en la brigada Henry Reef que cumplían misión en Turquía con una misión exitosa, muestra del humanismo de nuestra revolución y de nuestros trabajadores de la salud. Me salto. Este 26 de marzo, Cuba llevará a cabo elecciones para renovar su Asamblea Nacional. La postulación de candidatos emanó desde los Comités de Defensa de la Revolución, la, mujer, la Federación de Mujeres Cubanas, los estudiantes, así como todas las organizaciones de masa. Esta legislatura contará con 470 diputados, de ellos el 47,2 son delegados de base, el 20% jóvenes, para un promedio de 46 años en nuestra legislatura, el 55,3 mujeres, el 45,5 negros y mestizos y el 95,5 graduados de nivel superior. Con 
National Assembly. The nomination of candidates was made by the Committee for the Defense of the Revolution, the Federation of Cuban Women, the Federation of University Students, the Federation of High School Students, the National Association of Small Farmers, and the Central Organization of Cuban Workers. This legislature will have 470 deputies, of whom 47.02% will be grassroots delegates. 20% will be young people, meaning that the average age will be 46. 55.3% women, 45.5% black and mestizos, and 95.5% university graduates. Queridos amigos, los invitamos a fomentar la unidad en la universidad, a articular acciones entre ustedes y otras regiones del mundo para hacer de la campaña Amblo Cuba una prioridad en el trabajo. El próximo 28 de marzo, el compañero Fernando González Llor lanzará la convocatoria para desarrollar acciones de mayor alcance e impacto. Los convoco a diseñar nuevas estrategias para que, que se sumen a este empeño. Dear friends, we urge you to promote unity in diversity, to coordinate actions between yourselves and other regions of the world to make the Unblock Cuba campaign a priority. On March 28, Compañero Fernando González Lord will issue a call to develop actions of greater scope and impact. He will urge you to develop new strategies towards this goal. Espero sinceramente que esta conferencia contribuya a divulgar la verdad sobre Cuba entre el pueblo estadounidense. Una relación menos hostil y beneficiosa es siempre posible. Ustedes son muestra de una verdadera relación de amistad y de respeto. Los invito a visitar Cuba, a compartir jornadas memorables con nuestro pueblo y que puedan constatar que a pesar de las adversidades continuamos apostando por una sociedad más educada, con más científicos, más atletas, un país más tranquilo, libre de crímenes, de droga, de terrorismo y de violencia. I urge you to visit Cuba, to share memorable actions together with our people, and to witness how, despite the adversities, we continue to strive for a more educated society, with more scientists, more athletes, a more peaceful country, free of crime, drugs, terrorism, and violence. Deseo concluir agradeciendo el trabajo, el tiempo, el esfuerzo, y el empeño que dedican a la solidaridad con nuestro país. Les expreso la más profunda y sincera gratitud, asegurándoles que juntos continuaremos adelante, defendiendo la revolución cubana, que es también defender la justicia y la hermandad entre los pueblos. Muchas gracias. Thank you, and I'm sorry about that. Bueno, thank you so much, Noemi. That was a, a great call for unity and diversity to continue to build our campaign to unblock Cuba, and, and we will recommit to that work. Um, so, and thank you to the interpreter. I'm sorry, I don't know her name. Su Suzanne. 
Thank you so much. That's a, a very difficult task and she did a really well job. Um, so we have Kala and Shaquille who are gonna speak with us. They are co-chairs for the National Network on Cuba. So we wanna welcome them to the stage. They're gonna be talking about um, the work that is being done to get Cuba off the states that sponsor terrorism list, which we know is a whole lot of BS um, and a lot of hypocrisy behind that. So welcome Kala and Shaquille. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. On behalf of the National Network on Cuba, we'd like to thank the organizers of the U.S. Cuban Normalization Conference, our member organizations, as well as the Cuban delegation and representatives for their continued support and solidarity. I'm Shaquille Fontenot, one of the co-chairs of the National Network on Cuba. I'm Kala Walsh, one of the other co-chairs of NNOC, and we're here to talk about our Off the List campaign. We're gonna, be, uh, we're gonna try to be really quick since we know we're tight on time, and all of the resources that we're sharing will be shared with you all afterwards. Perfect. Awesome, so what is the state sponsored terrorism list? The US, a generator of genocide, a reaper of resources, the sultan of sanctions, the bringer of bombs, maintains this list and solely maintains this list. Being designated as a state sponsor of terrorism is one of the most serious legal designations and of course there is no evidence provided for Cuba being on this list. All of the reasons that Cuba is supposedly a state sponsor of terrorism can be easily debunked. So we won't go over that now because we have resources in our toolkit explaining why. And we know very well that the word and the term terrorist is used selectively by the US to demonize any countries that dare to challenge US imperialism and also for people within the US who are resisting oppression. That's why Cuba is slandered as a terrorist. That's why the US is charging dozens of Atlanta forest defenders as domestic terrorists for preventing trees from being cut down to build Cop City. So. And we all know very well that the US is the biggest state sponsor of terrorism in the entire world. And we cannot forget that US terrorism over the past centuries has resulted directly in the deaths of thousands and thousands of Cubans. So I'm not gonna read these restrictions because they're listed on the, sh on the screen, but I've spoken with a lot of farmers that wanna trade and work with Cuba directly. I've spoken with Cuban families and members that wanna send money to Cuba but can't because of this designation. It's already exacerbating the devastating effects of the blockade. And so we know that the blockade is bipartisan. We know that the blockade has been maintained by every Democrat and Republican president since the Cuban Revolution. And therefore, our efforts to end the blockade and to get Cuba off the SSOT list are bipartisan. This is bigger than just us. You know, we're not just bringing in those of us who are already politically conscious, who are already socialists and communists. We're building a broad coalition of people from all different sector, sectors of society because we are all impacted by this blockade and by US imperialism. And we know that we need mass popular pressure on Biden to get him to move on this issue. And we're focusing on the SSOT list because while the blockade is you know, hundreds and hundreds of different sanctions, this is a more tangible issue that Biden can change with one stroke of his pen. Absolutely, and so as Kala mentioned, we are working on a lot of resources right now to get Cuba off the list. So if you scan this code, you'll be able to access our toolkit that we'll be talking about briefly during this presentation. So right now we're in stage two of our three stage campaign. We are aligning political resources, um, materials with all of our member organizations, direct action, local and national, to bring about the taking Cuba off the state's monsters of terrorism list. So some of the highlights you'll see in the campaign, and again, I'll flash that QR code back up at the end, and you can visit the NNOC table to get more information as well. 
We have social media resources. We have information on passing resolutions. We have flyers and printable materials as well. And we want to get some resources from you. So here are just some of the highlights of resources that we have developed so far. All of these you can download directly from the toolkit. Uh, to quote our friend Angie Langdon, the battle of ideas is being fought online, on social media. Increasingly, the US and the CIA are undermining the Cuban revolution through social media warfare. So it's really important that we are countering their propaganda on this front. And we really encourage people to use these resources to share them as far and wide as possible. And we also have captions and additional information and pre-made graphics that you can use to promote this campaign worldwide. So these are examples of the flyers we mentioned earlier. Shout out to Angie again, and you can find these at our table. <laughs> so uh, there also have been 76 resolutions passed in support of the Cuban people. Um, some of those are supporting ending the criminal US economic blockade, saving lives through scientific collaboration with Cuba, as well as urging uh, Cuba to be removed from the state sponsors of terrorism list. This represents over 44 million people. So a resolution is a, a representation of the official will of a legislative body, but also the will of the people. So the United States people support Cuba. The people of the United States support Cuba. So we need your help too. We're developing resources, but we know all of y'all been to the island. I see some of y'all are silver haired out there. We know you've been there. <laughs> we, need your, we need your photos, we need your articles, we need your videos, we need everything you can submit because this is part of our campaign. You are part of this campaign and we need your support. So y'all are the first to see a sneak peek of the new NNOC website. And on this website, you'll be able to see resource lists, member publications, political education hubs. We're building a library. We're building reading groups. And we need your help to accomplish all of this work. One of the upcoming opportunities to really engage in this campaign is the National Call-In Days on March 15th and 16th. Shout out to all of the groups who've been organizing this effort, our superstar Mary Ansara for her leadership on this National Call-In Day. And we're coordinating it to be on these days so that the White House phones are ringing off the line. And if your organization hasn't signed on yet, it isn't too late. This link has all the information you need, a script to make a call. If you don't like talking on the phone, you can also write to the White House. But we really are coordinating more efforts between all our different organizations. This is bigger than just us. It's bigger than just the NNOC. Everyone is welcome to join in. And we also have uh, task forces that we've reorganized nationally, doing media, political education, resolutions, action work. Um, reach out to our email or come up to one of us if you're interested in getting involved. Everyone who is in support of Cuba are welcome to join these task forces. And we want to share a save the date for our off the list action happening June 25th in DC. It'll be a weekend of action. We hope to see all of y'all there. So save the date. And we want you to join us. So here's how you can contact us, take a picture of this slide, come find us later, and you can scan to download the toolkit. There's a little Zoom thingy in the way, so we'll share that with y'all a little later. But in the words of Fidel, a revolution is a struggle to the death between the future and the past. And in the words of Shaquille, it's past time for the U.S. to end the blockade and take Cuba off the list. Luchemos juntos, venceremos. Thank you so much um, to uh, Shaquille and to Kala for such a dynamic presentation about this important National Network on Cuba campaign uh, to demand that Biden remove Cuba from the state sponsors of terrorism list. Our next speaker is going to be joining us online and so we're just organizing that on Zoom. Uh, I do want to let folks know that we have about three more speakers in our plenary um, and then we'll be going to lunch, so we appreciate your patience. Um, we have some really important guests here with us today, and we want to give everyone their time to bring their presentations to the floor. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, um, I also wanted to let folks know that uh, in solidarity with the campaign uh, against the state sponsors of terrorism, 
um, list and our demand for its removal. Um, Friends of Cuba against the U.S. blockade Vancouver, along with the New York, New Jersey, Cuba Sea Coalition, are uh, launching this uh, uh, postcard campaign uh, officially. It's been happening since uh, December, but um, we're making it an official campaign between the United States and Canada to send postcards to the Biden administration, to the Biden White House, demanding that the Biden administration remove Cuba from the state sponsors of terrorism list. We see this very much as uh, support and another tool in the great campaign being organized by the National Network on Cuba. Um, and we've got lots of these postcards for folks. Um, we're recommending, if you can, uh, put one in the mail uh, every week or every month. Let Biden know. Take a selfie of yourself when you put this in the mail um, and, uh, and let folks know on social media that you're sending off a weekly or monthly postcard. Um, and again, use that hashtag off the list. Uh, make sure that we're building this campaign as united and broad as we can. Um, myself and Aaron will be speaking at the Actions in the Street uh, workshop this afternoon a little bit more um, about this campaign uh, as well. So uh, as we go, we've got uh, now with us Professor Leo Grande, um, and it is a big honor to introduce him uh, here joining us on Zoom. I think everybody can see you. Can we do an audio check? I'm right here. I'm here to talk with you. All right. I, I can hear you through the computer, but it's not coming out through our sound system here, so we're just going to... Um, do another uh, test here. Um, how's this? We're still just one. We're going to try a different button here and see if we can get it to to click. Go go ahead, please. Hey, there we go. Wonderful. So I introduce to you again Professor William Leo Grande from the American University in Washington, D.C. Please give him a warm welcome. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, uh, but I can here in Washington, D.C. I can feel the energy in the room. Uh, you know, just a few weeks ago, uh, Juan Gonzalez, who's the Latin American director of the National Security Council, described Biden's policy as neither Trump's nor Obama's, but something in between. Uh, as I'm sure most of you all know, last May, Biden relaxed some of the sanctions that Trump went on to do. He made it a little bit easier to travel, not as easy as it should be, and he made it a little bit easier to send remittances to family members in Cuba. And that was in response to pressure from you from progressive Democrats in Congress and from progressive governments in Latin America. So the question right now is, will Biden do more, or will policy stay frozen more or less where it is until at least after the 2024 election? And I think that's an open question right now. I think it depends in part on how much more political pressure can be brought to bear on the administration to follow up with some additional moves. And, I, and the most important one, is indeed taking Cuba off the state, uh, the State Department's list of state supporters of international terrorism. You know, as you talk to people about this issue, some of them are going to ask you, well, why should we do Cuba the favor, lifting the embargo or taking them off the terrorism list? And the answer is that uh, normalization of U.S.-Cuban relations is in the best interest of the people of both the United States and Cuba. You know, some years ago, uh, in explaining why Cuba and the United States needed to get along with one another, uh, Cuban diplomat Ricardo Alarcón said, we are near neighbors, and unlike people, we can't move away. <laughs> there, there are many, many issues of mutual interest uh, that Cuba and the United States share, and they can only be effectively managed by cooperating with one another environmental protection, public health, as we've just seen with the pandemic, uh, and migration. You know, in the last two years of his presidency, uh, President Obama signed 23 agreements uh, with the United States, or with Cuba, and uh, Donald Trump ignored or violated 
every single one of them. Uh, and Biden so far has only restarted cooperation on two of those issues, on migration and on law enforcement. There's a lot more that could be done. Educational, scientific, and cultural exchanges obviously benefit both countries. Uh, before Trump, more than 600,000 non-Cuban American travelers from the United States were visiting Cuba every year. There was a flowering of cultural exchanges, music, and art during the last two years of the Obama administration. Uh, and Cuban advances in biotechnology could obviously benefit the United States. Most importantly, I would say the, the lung cancer uh, vaccine that Cuba is currently working to develop with Roswell Cancer Institute in Buffalo. <laughs> There's potential economic benefits for both countries. Cuba and the United States are natural trading partners because they're so close. As someone mentioned earlier, U.S. farmers would love to be able to trade more with Cuba. And Cuban America, the Cuban American community, the progressives in the Cuban American community, uh, can be a natural economic bridge for the United States. Uh, lots of U.S. businesses are interested in, in doing business in Cuba, uh, as we saw during the Obama opening. And there are benefits for Cuban Americans. Uh, more cooperative relations between Cuba and the United States make it easier for Cuban Americans to travel, to visit their families, to send remittances, to help their families. And Donald Trump restricted both of those things. Biden has loosened them a little bit, but there's still more to go. Finally, the US policy towards Cuba is doing serious damage to our relations with the rest of the world. As all of you know, I'm sure, no one else in the world supports the U.S. embargo. The United Nations has voted for 30 years in a row in the United States to end the embargo, and with almost no one else supporting the U.S. position. Friction with our allies in Europe uh, because of the extraterritorial reach of certain elements of the embargo, like Title III of the helms burden the complication of our relations with Latin America is perhaps the most serious. It's one of the main reasons that Obama changed policy in 2014. And one of his senior officials called US policy towards Cuba an albatross around the neck of US cooperation with the rest of Latin America. Just last year, we saw the summit of the Americas nearly collapse because of a partial boycott over the exclusion of Cuba Venezuela, and Nicaragua. Today, almost every government in Latin America, every major government, is led by progressives. There's a fundamental contradiction today between Joe Biden saying he stands with the Cuban people, which he says every time he speaks about it, and continuing a policy aimed at strangling the Cuban economy, which increases the misery of the people. And that's why the last three popes have all opposed the U.S. embargo, including the Polish Pope, John Paul II, no friend of communism. The next step to moving U.S. policy in the right direction is to take Cuba off the list of state sponsors which sponsors the state. <laughs> it doesn't belong on the list, it has never belonged on it, and it's important to keep demanding that Biden, the Biden administration do an honest review of Cuba's designation and take Cuba off that list. When Secretary of State Blinken traveled to Latin America last year, he promised President uh, Petro in Colombia that the United States would in fact review Cuba's designation. They haven't done it. You know, continuing the embargo is sacrificing U.S. interests just to satisfy a small constituency of Cuban Americans in South Florida and their congressional friends at the expense of everyone else, in both the United States and in Cuba. And the irony is that those folks are not going to vote for Joe Biden anyway. <laughs> Normalizing U.S.-Cuban relations is not a gift or a favor that the United States is giving to the Cuban government. The United States should normalize relations and end the embargo because it's the right thing to do because it would serve the interests of both the people in the United States and the people of Cuba. Don't let Joe Biden forget it. Thank you.
Well, we want to thank you so much, Professor Leo Grande, for being with us. We felt the heat. You brought the heat to the house. So thank you so much. <laughs> Don't let Joe Biden forget. And it is extremely important to let Joe Biden know that these policies are retrograde. They are too old to be in the new. There's a new world that is being born, and it's a pluripolar world, as Chavez would say, and we need to get ready for that. So, comrades, I have the immense pleasure of welcoming uh, Professor August Nymphs into the stage. And, you know, I also want to acknowledge that we have hundreds of people that are on the Zoom. So why don't you give them a round of applause? People are tuning in from all across the country and they're holding watch parties and, you know, hopefully this also becomes something that people could watch again and could engage in more conversations around. Um, Professor Augen Nibs, thank you so much for being with us. He is from the University of Minnesota. He is co-editor and translator of Race in Cuba. He has written many articles such as why there are no George Floyds in Cuba. So we want to welcome you. Thank you so much for being with us. For this most shameful reason, Washington is committed to putting an end 
to the Cuban Revolution, regardless of which of the two capitalist parties is in office. There should be no doubt that the Democratic Party is, like the Republicans, is a capitalist party. Both Biden and Pelosi have reiterated that point in recent comments for those who might think or wish otherwise. But there's another, there's another reason, more important in my opinion. So sorry, a few people are having trouble hearing. We can't raise the volume on the microphone. So if you could just try and speak. Oh, okay, sure. Okay. Oh, wow. Sorry, folks. <laughs> but there's another more important reason for Washington and Wall Street's hatred of the Cuban Revolution. It's very existence. A State Department official in the new Democratic Party Johnson administration explained it this way as Piero Lejesas reports in his wonderful book, Conflicting Missions. He said, look, even if we could work out something quick about it, some kind of peaceful coexistence as we have with the Soviet, Soviet Union. Our problem is that the revolution's existence gives everyone in Latin America who might want to emulate Cuba strong heart. That is encouragement to do the same. In other words, Cuba as a bad example. A bad example if your interests are in protecting the interests of capital and not the interests of the working masses everywhere. Yes, there have been differences between the two capitalist parties about U.S. policy toward Cuba. But those differences are about how to get rid of the Cuban Revolution, not whether it should be gotten rid of. The long hold held and predominant method is to squeeze the revolution to death, to make things as difficult as possible for the Cuban people so that they might rise up one day and overthrow their revolution. For a brief moment, the alternative strategy was in place, what some of us call the hug the revolution to death strategy, what the Obama initiative was about. In hindsight, we now know that was an exception to the rule. With the Cuban revolution faces, facing its greatest challenges ever, but at least since the collapse of the Soviet Union, we should not be surprised that the squeeze the revolution to death strategy have returned. What Deputy Foreign Minister Fernandez Nicosio was no doubt referring to. From Washington's perspective, why give the Cuban government a break if it looks like it's on ropes? This is exactly, they say, what we've been waiting for, what we've been looking for for the last six decades. Why play nice with the Cubans? This doesn't mean that Washington's foreign policy can't occasionally act in a way that serves the interests of the working class. There's no better example of that fact than what the South African anti-apartheid movement was able to accomplish. Work I had the privilege of doing for more than two decades. But we were successful because of all of the local level grassroots work we did in the churches, in the labor movement, in educational centers and civic organizations, reaching out to and educating working people of all skin colors in the United States eventually paid off. That's what motivated Congress to do the right thing. And that's the right thing. Congress to do the right thing in 1986 in overriding the Reagan administration's veto of the Congressional Anti-Apartheid Act. Thus getting our unions, local and state governments, to pass resolutions to end the embargo is enormously important. The 76 different resolutions we heard about earlier is of enormous, uh, uh, enormously important. We want, we want to make sure that those resolutions actually represent 44 million people. It's only the beginning of that work, it seems to me. More important in my opinion. Is, Please keep going. I'm gonna just double check what's happening online. But it's just somebody on the Zoom is speaking. Maybe they forgot to mute. Sorry. I'm just about finished. It. Just said you have here in New York City and the New Jersey area uh, have been successful in passing resolutions. We've had some successes in Minnesota in getting local and state governments to do, this, to do the same. But we have not often, and I include myself in this shotgun, we have not done enough to make sure 
the resolutions are publicized as widely as possible among the working class, in their workplaces, their neighborhoods, to use them as tools for mobilizing. Can these resolutions give significance if the members of the unions and the constituents of the legislators don't know about it? Let me give one example of what I think is open to us today. I think the people of East Palestine, Ohio, would love, whose lives have been upended by the train derailment, a disaster made possible by capital, something that I would know about railroads and capital, would welcome hearing news about a government that actually looks out for the welfare of its citizens and not prioritize the interests of the corporations that threaten their lives for the sake of making profits. I think that they would welcome that. I think that they would welcome news about how the government can promote the development of medicines and vaccines without having to use the profit motive uh, to do so. A government that's only 90 miles from their shores. A government that does this despite Washington doing everything it can to prevent them from serving not only their own citizens, but those in far off places owing to the nobility of the selfless proletarian internationalism of the Cuban Revolution. These are the audiences we should reach out more to because they are the ones who would benefit the most from having the kind of government that exists in Cuba, a government that represents working people unlike what exists in the United States. They are the audiences that have an inherent class interest, I argue, in wanting to be in the involved. Again, I thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me to be on the panel to share my views, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. online, it seems that there was some uh, backup echo from the other microphone um, during August Nimps presentation, but thank you so much Professor August Nimps for such an amazing presentation. Um, and so uh, I would like to now invite up onto the stage uh, Carlos Lasso. Profe Carlos Lasso. organizing monthly caravan actions on the last Sunday of the month against the blockade for over two years now. He's been traveling the world spreading a message um, that the Cuban American community is changing and that the Cuban American community wants uh, friendship between the United States and Cuba. It's a beautiful message and we're so honored that he's here today to speak with us. Please welcome Carlos Lasso. I have a, uh, we have an audience also like sí. almost 150 people who are watching this in Spanish and I would like to talk actually the, the, the speech is in English but I need to, to say it in Spanish for them too okay I hope that we can translate okay I will help you yeah this is it queridos hermanos y hermanas es un honor estar aquí hoy levantando las voces otra vez para el levantamiento del bloqueo, el embargo o como quiera que se le quiera llamar a esa política de guerra económica que el gobierno de los Estados Unidos impone en Cuba. Dear brothers and sisters, it is a pleasure to be here today with you as we unite and raise our voices once again in order to demand that the blockade be lifted against Cuba or the embargo be lifted against Cuba or however you would like to politically call this economic war against the people of Cuba. 
como cubanoamericano, yo soy parte de un creciente sector de nuestra comunidad que pone a un lado creencias políticas o religiosas y quiere levantar el bloqueo y construir puentes de amor entre los pueblos de Cuba, los Estados Unidos y todo el mundo. I represent uh, a growing Cuban American community that is either part of a political movement or a religious movement or a spiritual movement uh, that wants to pledge to build bridges of love between the people of Cuba and the United States. Durante más de dos años, Puentes de Amor ha organizado y participado en caravanas y eventos en los Estados Unidos y alrededor del mundo para traer conciencia acerca de la necesidad de terminar estas criminales políticas que tratan de asfixiar a las familias cubanas. For over two years we've been having caravans, uh, Puentes de Amor caravans and other actions across the United States and around the world uh, to bring together people in the need to raise awareness uh, of why we need to end this criminal uh, policy that is trying to strangle Cuban families. Durante más de dos años, cada último domingo del mes, hemos levantado nuestras voces pidiéndole al gobierno de los Estados Unidos que oiga las voces de los norteamericanos, que oiga las voces de los cubanos, que oiga las voces del mundo entero y que levante el bloqueo. For more than two years, on the last Sunday of every month, we have been raising our voices to demand that the U.S. government listen to the voices of Americans, listen to the voices of Cubans, and listen to the voices of the whole world that we have to end this blockade. En el pasado hemos establecido asociación y hermandad con organizaciones como Code Pink, The People's Forum y otras para llevar a Cuba medicamentos, leche en polvo a hospitales pediátricos y ayuda humanitaria. We've been working on important campaigns with other associations, including Code Pink and the People's Forum and other organizations to bring medicine, to bring powdered milk, to bring other necessary items to pediatric hospitals in Cuba. Entre, entre ayuda and we hemos sido parte de un movimiento que sigue creciendo y que se va haciendo más grande cada mes. Between these uh, humanitarian aids and the caravan work, we have been seeing our movement and our and our work growing every month. Uh, Yo, además de, de nuestros objetivos y además de lo que hacemos, le quiero hablar hoy de la caravana de Miami. Cada mes, cubanos y no cubanos, personas de diferentes credos e ideologías, marchan en caravana en la ciudad de Miami, pidiéndole al gobierno de los Estados Unidos que saque a Cuba de la lista de países terroristas y levante el bloqueo. Every month, both Cubans and non-Cubans are uniting in Miami uh, from different uh, places on the political spectrum in order to demand that Cuba be removed from the list of state sponsors of terrorism and that the blockade be ended. La caravana de Miami y la comunidad cubano-americana tiene un lugar especial en la lucha contra el bloqueo, pues demuestra que la mayoría de los cubanos americanos priorizamos a las familias y queremos levantar esas sanciones. The Miami Caravan and the Cuban American community have a very special place in the struggle against the blockade because it is impacting their families because they have a need to protect the links with their families. La caravana de Miami hoy está bajo ataque. Los derechos de expresarse están siendo atacados con intimidación y violencia en esa ciudad. The Miami caravan today is under attack. Their freedom, uh, freedom of expression is under attack. 
and uh, their ability to stand up uh, against the U.S. blockade on Cuba is under attack. Hermanos y hermanas, nosotros como Puentes de Amor tenemos una visión. Creemos que el bloqueo debe ser levantado, tiene que ser levantado y va a ser levantado. Brothers and sisters, we have a vision that the blockade on Cuba must be lifted and that the blockade on Cuba will be lifted. Pero también creemos que para alcanzar ese objetivo necesitamos el apoyo de cada persona decente en los Estados Unidos y en el mundo. Hombres y mujeres de buena voluntad, unidos en la decencia, en la humanidad y en el amor. But we also believe that in order to achieve these goals, we need to bring together all decent and human loving people around the world. We need to unite. El bloqueo a Cuba mata niños. La inclusión a Cuba en la lista de países terroristas le niega a Cuba recursos y está matando al pueblo cubano. The blockade on Cuba kills children. Cuba being included on the state sponsors of terrorism list is making it so that Cuba is not able to access much needed resources which is impacting on those growing up in Cuba today. Un día el bloqueo va a ser levantado. Un día miraremos al pasado y veremos todo este tiempo de agresión y animosidad como algo de, 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 de pasadas generaciones. Pero para que eso pase necesitamos luchar este día y todos los días necesitamos poner a un lado nuestras diferencias cualquiera que ellas sean y unirnos en el amor a la familia y a la humanidad but for that future to come we need to fight today we need to come together despite differences um, despite uh, issues we need to come together in unity um, for peace and, and for an end to the blockade hermanas y hermanos un mundo mejor, mejor es posible. Levantemos el bloqueo. Únanse a nosotros en las caravanas cada último domingo del mes hasta que el bloqueo sea levantado. Brothers and sisters, a better world is possible. And we hope that you will continue and join us on the last Sunday of every month as we continue this campaign of caravans against the blockade. La familia cubana cuenta y necesita del apoyo de ustedes y de la solidaridad. Gracias, que Dios los bendiga a todos y terminemos diciendo Cuba sí, bloqueo no. Cuba sí, Cuba sí, Cuba sí. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Thank you so much, Carlos, for the call to human decency. Sometimes we forget it's about that, about humanity and being able to build bridges of love that give life. That's what we're here for. Um, so up next, we have the pleasure of hearing from amazing activist, co-founder of Code Pink, longtime anti-war leader in the U.S., Medea Benjamin. So, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. So I get behind this thing, you can't see me. I want to just say how much a privilege it is to go after Carlos Lasso. Because, you know, some of you might remember in the old days when um, people who were doing this work in Miami were bombed uh, and think, well, it's not like that anymore. Well, we might not have bombings now, 
But Carlos gets death threats probably every single day. The people in Miami who go on the caravans are losing their jobs, they're losing their homes. They are so courageous to come out Miami because that is a place where Cuban Americans who say they love democracy so much they want to see democracy in Cuba, yet they have disdain for the very free speech that we should have in this country and be able to go through the streets in Miami without fearing for our lives. So I want to thank all of the Cuban Americans who are doing this very hard work of saying yes to the Puentes de Amor. Now, Sandra Levinson started out saying how many people wanted to live in Cuba, move to Cuba, and probably a lot of us in this room have thought of that. But some of us actually know that we have to go into the the beast and have moved to Washington, D.C. to do that work. <laughs> And I want to thank the people of a new lobby group that represents our voice in Washington. And it's called ACERE Alliance for Cuba Respect and Engagement. But some of you might know it for the cool way that it's a play on words of que acere, right? Uh, which is kind of what's happening. Que bola acere. Uh, <laughs> que bola acere. Uh, and if you're on the ACERE Advisory or Steering Committee, can you please stand up? to get a round of thanks from people here. And some of the Asede people, we're gonna put up the website right now, are Cuban Americans. We have a special thank for those of you who are Cuban Americans on the advisory board. Uh, what Asede does is translate the kind of energy in this room to Washington, D.C. And you know, when you love someone like we love the Cuban people, sometimes we have to do things that we don't like doing. And that's engaging with people in Washington, D.C. We hold our collective noses <laughs> and we dive deep into Washington. We do advocacy days, we do uh, um, uh, briefings for members of Congress, we put materials that all of you can use. We're very engaged with you on the call-in days of March 16th and 17th. And you know, it's kind of funny that at Washington, D.C. in the White House, they only allow you to call in on certain days, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from 11 to 3, because they can't afford to have a hotline that you could call the White House anytime you wanted, ha ha. But um, we are anxious and have dozens of groups now that are gonna flood the White House call in line. Raise your hand if you're gonna call in over and over and over again on the 15th and 16th so they hear from us. The other thing that I wanted to let you know is about a, uh, a day that we're going to have in Washington, D.C. Uh, on, at the end of April, April 28th and 29th, and we'll pull up that, it's America's Policy Forum. This is a gathering to finally say, after 200 years of the Monroe Doctrine, it's time to bury that doctrine. And we will have people coming not only from the United States, but from around Latin America to join us in that call. Now on the Friday before, which is the 28th of April, we will have an advocacy day. Those of you who can make it to Washington DC, we guarantee that you will have fun marching through those halls of Congress. We'll go to the office of Bob Menendez, Boo. We'll go to the office of Marco Rubio. Boo. We'll do teach-ins and takeovers of their offices. Yay! We will visit your Congress people who probably deserve a boo. Um, and we will be telling them to take Cuba off that damn terrorist list. We will be telling them that Cuba is a victim of U.S. terrorism. It is not a sponsor of terrorism. And we are asking you 
How many in this room have done something to engage your member of Congress since the beginning of this year? Be honest, raise your hands. Okay, so that is a minority. We have to turn that around. Raise your hand if in the last year you have had a face-to-face -face meeting with your member of Congress. So look around. I can count them on one hand. One, two, three, four, five. That is not right. We have to change that. You have to demand a meeting with your member of Congress. And if they don't give it to you, you have to go to their local office and you have to do a rally outside their office. Now, how many people does it take to do a rally? Two, three, four. You don't need a lot of people. They get very nervous when there's somebody outside of their office. But you really need to demand a meeting. And it works. Let me tell you, it works. We interrupted a head of, a, of one of the committees when he was giving a talk in Washington, D.C., got right on the stage and said what he's saying is absolutely false. And guess what? We got an hour meeting with him afterwards. So it works. You have to engage your members of Congress. We know we don't live in democracy, but they think that this is a democracy, and they think that they represent us. So we have to demand that they represent us. And in general, what they have to represent is not the small cabal of people in Miami who are the haters. They have to re represent us, the lovers, who love the people of Cuba and demand a change in our policies. And so as we close out here, we are going to hear from one of the few lovers in the Congress, and that is Jim McGovern. And Jim McGovern is somebody who actually has been to Cuba many times and fell in love with the Cuban people. But the reason that he is good on Cuba is not only that. It's also that there is a very vibrant and engaged community in Western Massachusetts that are constantly on him to do more. And so we want to thank that community, and we want to thank Jim McGovern, who we're going to hear from now. Thank you. Thank you very much for your patience. Let's go to that now. Hi, everybody. This is Congressman Jim McGovern from Massachusetts. And I want to thank the sponsors and the entire volunteer staff for making this weekend's conference possible. I'm grateful to have been invited to say a few welcoming words to those of you attending in person and live streaming across the United States and the world. Just a few years ago, I got the United States to Cuba were well on their way not only to establish normalized diplomatic relations, but on a path to normal relations in every sphere, public and private. On December 17, 2014, I stood on the tarmac of Andrews Air Force Base, waiting for the plane that would finally bring home Alan Gross, a U.S. citizen unjustly imprisoned for five years in Cuba. On TV, President Obama was announcing a sweeping set of changes to U.S. policy and regulations that over the next two years opened the U.S. and Cuba up to one another in ways not imagined over 50 years. I thought that finally, finally, our two peoples would have the opportunity to create a new future together. But I was wrong. We all know what happened next. The election of Donald Trump, who over four years gradually overturned President Obama's actions toward Cuba. During his final days in office, he even returned Cuba to the state sponsor of terrorism list. The increased financial restrictions, the tightening of the embargo, the SST list, coincided with the pandemic, which brought nearly every economy in the world to its knees, including that of Cuba. While I had hoped that things would change under newly elected President Biden, he and his administration had moved too slowly, squandering precious time to improve U.S.-Cuban relations. As many Cubans took to the streets to demand social and economic change, as well as political change, U.S. economic and financial restrictions remained unchanged and the Cuban people suffered, and they continue to suffer. I was in Havana in December, and I have never seen the Cuban people facing such hardship. 
Hundreds of thousands feel so hopeless about their future on the island that they feel like they have no choice but to leave. And I was angry that U.S. policy was contributing to that suffering. But it's not the kind of anger that paralyzes. It's the kind of anger that brought me back to Congress more committed than ever to push and push this administration to change its policies, to stop contributing to the hardships being suffered by the Cuban people in our name. If the U.S. government wants to end the mass migration from Cuba, then it needs to take responsibility for the role America's policies play in forcing people to leave their homes, their families, their culture, and their language. So this conference couldn't be more timely or more important. I imagine that most of you are aware that in the U.S. House of Representatives, we face a very difficult situation. Over the next two years, the Republican majority will bring back Cold War policies on Cuba and vote after vote. And frankly, we might not be able to defeat them. I can only hope that the Senate will not imitate the House. In the House, we must go back to the basics and rebuild, member by member, the commitment to change U.S. policy toward Cuba. It's hard work, and it requires each of you. It requires every national organization and grassroots network to build local coalitions and grassroots support. That's what will give you strength. That's what will give you power. And that's the kind of coalition no member of Congress can ignore. We once had scores of such diverse and active coalitions. We need to rebuild or reactivate them if we're going to create the change we want to see in U.S. policy. We need to do the same thing inside Congress. Right now, one of the most important tasks we can take on is to press the Biden administration to remove Cuba from the state sponsor of terrorism list. I hope everyone is planning to participate in the national call into the White House this coming week, demanding that President Biden remove Cuba from the state sponsor of terrorism list. To be heard, really heard at the White House, that call in needs to be massive. And please know that there are groups of House members and senators who are also pushing the administration to remove, remove Cuba from the SST list. You are not alone. I also want to announce that last week, on March 3rd, a group of bipartisan senators introduced S-653, a bill to lift the trade embargo on Cuba. The leaders of this effort are Senators Klobuchar, Moran, Murphy, Marshall, and Warren. Each of you now has a bill to work on that would end the embargo. More importantly, it demonstrates that in the Senate there is still a bipartisan group of senators willing to stand up for change. It also opens the opportunity for other initiatives in areas like travel and trade. Opportunities exist. Hope exists. Successful actions can make a difference. Can inspire more people to get involved and more members of Congress to take action. So I can't thank you enough for participating in this weekend's conference, and I can't thank you enough for allowing me this time to welcome you and express my support for all of your hard work. Thank you very much. Again, 
our comrades um, that are coming from Cuba are going to get their lunches first. And right after that, we are asking folks to look at this sheet to find out where the workshops are. They're, they're all straight down this hallway. Okay. Straight down the hallway. All, all are down. straight down that hallway, but <laughs> in this sheet, you have the actual room number. So make sure you lock, locate the numbers. Don't lose a lot of time between getting the boxes and going into the workshops. We're trying to start the workshops as soon as possible, which means about 2.40, 2.45, which is not too far from now. Um, we want to thank everybody for being here. We want to thank everyone for your patience. We want to thank the Cuban delegation for being with us and welcoming, welcoming them into the space.